So we're still asking for the grace of unshakable confidence in God, and maybe in a particular way in the Lordship of Jesus. So tragically, for many of the people in our pews, and maybe even for some of us, when we say Jesus is Lord, that's simply the conclusion of a prayer. That's not what that means. <laughs> Lord's rule. And there's only one. And his name is Jesus. And so we're asking him for this confidence that we want. So we looked at why did he come and what was he doing on the cross. The third part of uh, rescued, uh, I would say, is so what difference does it make? You know, a friend of mine's always uh, fond of saying, like, so what, now what? All right, so he's done all this. Now what? So what difference does any of this make for, for you and for me and for the people that we want to share the gospel with? So we just want to take a little bit of time to look at some of the differences that Jesus has made by his passion and resurrection. And these aren't exhaustive. They're not intended to be, but they are some things to soak in. So we're going to walk through these. Let's just list them. Jesus has humiliated the enemy, destroyed death, transferred us, recreated us, rendered sin impotent, given us authority over the enemy, and sent us on mission to get his world back, which is going to tee up what we're going to do here. So, oh, and by the way, he's divinized us. So first, he's humiliated the enemy. So let's take a look, just a little bit of time to soak in each one of these, okay? And again, this isn't meant to be exhaustive, but it is meant to help us understand why this is such extraordinary news, right? This is one of increasingly my favorite passages in Scripture. Paul says in his letter to the Colossians, God has disarmed the principalities and powers. It's more literally, he has stripped them naked. What are the principalities and powers? Sin, death, hell, and Satan and all their minions. Huh? He has stripped them naked, making a public example of them or humiliating them, triumphing over them in him or in his cross. That word triumph for us, we live in Michigan, so we haven't seen a triumph in a long time, right? Um, lions, <laughs> Spartans, Wolverines, it's been a banner decade, right, for Michigan. So, um, so a triumph for us, I don't know what it conjures up for you, but for the ancient Roman world, um, a triumph is a very particular word. Uh, this is a triumph. So a triumph is something like a mega parade in an empire filled with parades. There were very precise conditions under which it was held. They usually had something to do with the emperor. At the end of celebrations of triumphs, or the later years, they were always only emperors. Before that, it was emperor or a general. After a huge military conquest, and he would come into Rome in his chariot, surrounded by um, members of his legion, with the people that he had captured behind him, and all the spoils, right? So, you ever been to Rome? This is the Arch of Titus. The Arch of Titus has engraved inside the arch. This is after the sack of Jerusalem. This is a triumph, leaving Jerusalem heading back to Rome, and they're carrying the menorah, the seven-branch candlestick from the temple. Huh? So they, they emptied out the temple treasury, and they brought it into Rome. That's a triumph. So Caesar's seated here, right? So uh, one of the favorite images I have of a triumph, Julius Caesar, after eight years of battling the king of Gaul up in France, finally defeats the empire of Gaul. And the Roman soldiers apprehend the king of Gaul. They bring him in front of Caesar. And as he's standing there in front of all the Roman soldiers, one of the soldiers comes and slits his robes, and suddenly the king is standing with no clothes on in front of everybody. They push him down on his knees. They take the Roman eagle, which is the symbol of Rome. They make him kiss it to tell him, you've lost. They stand him up. They chain his hands behind his back, and they put him in a cage and they begin to drive back to Rome in their chariots. This is the beginning of a triumph. And then Caesar enters into Rome in his chariot, all cleaned up, and he's got this long line of all the things that he's 
captured, and at the end of the long line is a man in a cage, chained with no clothes on, and a sign above his head, which says, this is the one who used to threaten us. He's not going to threaten us anymore. That, St. Paul tells us, is what Jesus has done to Satan. He has humiliated the enemy. However, as Monsignor Knox says, this is not exactly like, hey, don't worry, it's all over. This is not an all clear. This is rather the announcement that you actually have a chance to win now because of what it is that the Lord has done for us. Peter reminds us, huh? be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But as somebody said once, the key there is to remember that a lion that's roaring hasn't caught anything. It's trying to intimidate. Roaring lions, or lions once they've made a kill or a catch, like they're, they're pretty quiet because they don't want to share it with anybody. Uh, but the devil's prowling, he's roaring, he's trying to intimidate and to scare and to tempt you and me. He's out there, he's real. Tell him to go to the foot of the cross where he was humiliated. Second thing he's done, he, Jesus has destroyed death. What difference does all this make, huh? We just had this passage last Sunday at Mass, right? Where is this mountain that Isaiah talks about? On this mountain, he will destroy the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. The closest you and I get to that mountain in this life is at Mass. Remember my first pastor, never forget, um, when I was a newly ordained priest, he was celebrating the funeral of one of his best friends, and he looked at the widow at the beginning of Mass, and he says, I just want to remind you that you will never be closer to Jim again than when you come to Mass, because there's only one Mass, and it happens in heaven, when everybody's there. And every time we walk into Mass, we walk into heaven, even if I can only see like four people. But I've walked into heaven at that moment. I'm surrounded by all the angels and saints and all the souls in purgatory. And he says, he looks at this widow and he says, and when the Eucharist is held up, it's like a two-way mirror. And on the other side is Jim. And you see what looks like bread, but isn't bread. And on the other side is him, and your glance will meet as you look at Jesus together. That's an amazing image. We're going to bring the Lord out in a, in a bit. We're going to have some time to pray. and We're going to get onto the mountain. It'll be as close as we can get on the mountain when we're in front of the Blessed Sacrament or when we're at Mass. huh? God promises this, right? The veil that is spread over all nations, he will destroy. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. That's a promise, people. I don't know about you, I cry all the time for my family members and my loved ones and my friends who've died. Not for them, for me. I'm happy for them. I'm not so happy for me. <laughs> but the Lord promises I'm going to feel his hands on my face and he will wipe my tears and we will be together again because of what it is that he has done. Paul to the Corinthians, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. First Thessalonians, huh? We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as those who have no hope. Not that you may not grieve. We all grieve. But you may not grieve like those who have no hope. The extraordinary thing, because of what it is that God has done for us in Jesus, is there's still a very real communion between us and them. Right? There's a thin veil between me and my friends and family members and your friends and your family members. And I talk more to my parents now than I ever did. 
all because of what it is that has happened by Jesus' death and resurrection. Paul to Timothy, huh? Our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death. Like, we just made a law that said no more dying. That's what that means. Death has no hold on me. That's why I'm not afraid of dying anymore. I'm going to die. It can't keep me. You're going to die. It can't keep you. Somehow we got used to talking about this stuff as if it's ordinary. This is extraordinary news. Hebrews. What do we know about Hebrews? It's not a letter. Paul didn't write it, and it's not to the Hebrews. Other than that, it's spot on. So, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he likewise, he himself likewise partook of the same nature that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil. There's some of us in here who are still afraid of dying. Maybe when we bring the Lord out in the Blessed Sacrament, we ask the Lord, Lord, will you do this for me? Deliver me from this. Because I'm not supposed to be afraid of dying anymore. What else has he done? He's transferred us. So we, we looked at this passage earlier, Colossians 1, 13 to 14. This is the passage I read now at the beginning of every baptism I celebrate. Like before we do anything, I'm going to share this with the people that I'm celebrating with, and then I'm going to explain it. Because that's, this is what happens in baptism. Like, here's this cute little baby, sort of, right? <laughs> and it's so innocent, but it's not, because it actually belongs to the kingdom of darkness. Which isn't to say it's some wicked child, it means it can't fight against the powers of sin and death. It has no defense against them. That's why it belongs to the dominion of darkness. So if you could see its spiritual birth certificate, it would say it belongs to death. It, it has no chance. But in baptism, something happens, right? He's delivered us, transferred us, moved us from the dominion of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We give people these little baptismal certificates and, and I don't know what they do with them. I think most of them throw them out, unfortunately. That's like a new spiritual birth certificate. Like you get new papers when you're baptized. You move. A friend of mine is a Baptist minister. He tried to explain it this way. He says, imagine if you will, and for some of us this is easy to imagine, you grew up in a really abusive home. Alcoholic father, always screaming at his wife, always screaming at you. You do everything you can to not stay home. You get involved in every sport, every extracurricular activity, everything so that you don't have to go home. Because when you're home, plates fly. And so you sneak home late at night. And then you go back the next day and you just stay out all the time again. And across the street from you lives this annoyingly happy family. And every night out the window you can hear the father playing in the front yard with his kids. And they're laughing. And they're having fun. And you listen and you are jealous as all get out. And this goes on for years. And then one day when you're home alone, you hear a knock on the door and you go down and open up the door and it's the dad from across the street. And he says, do you want to come live with us? You don't even pack. That's adoption. That's baptism. You move from the house of a tyrant to the house of a good father. Han, again in that commentary to Romans, the recipient of baptism undergoes a death to the bondage of sin and is brought to life again by a reception of grace, transferred from dominion of death, the dominion of sin, to the kingdom of life. We say this in the Roman Missal during Lent, huh? It, these things show up all the time when you start looking for them. By the mystery of the incarnation, he has led the human race that walked in darkness into the radiance of the faith and has brought those born in slavery to ancient sin through the waters of regeneration to make them your adopted children. That's how we were born. I'm born enslaved 
to sin and death. But the Lord's transferred us. Rutledge, again, it takes hard mental work to enter Paul's thought world and understand that his words do not describe a bondage. This is so important right now because this is what the world thinks of us. To become a Christian is less, not more. To become a Christian is to undergo slavery. No, it's to undergo freedom. Right? Paul's thought world understood that his words do not describe a bondage to a harsh puritanical code imposed upon us by a tyrannical outside force. He means the opposite. The gospel of Christ means precisely deliverance from tyrannical outside forces into a realm of light and life. Here's a key question. Don't raise your hand. Don't nod your head. Do you believe that? That the gospel's more, not less. That to be obedient to the Lord is perfect freedom, not slavery. What else has he done? He's recreated us, huh? If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. That's not poetry there. The old has passed away. The new has come. I told you about some of the things that happened in my life. I could tell you a lot more, but those are some of them. I was just sharing with somebody at the break. I felt like the Lord gave me an image years ago when I was beginning to come to grips with some of the things that had happened to me when I was a kid. And I had this image of a camp, you know, and I was the camp, uh, like a military camp. And into the camp walked the Lord and he just planted his flag. As if to say, you're mine now. And I claim you. And I have recreated you. And you are not defined by what happened to you. That's what the enemy tries to do. Define me by my past. I'm not defined by my past. I'm a new man. You're a new man. You're a new woman. Not in theory, in reality. Because of what it is that the Lord's done. How many people do we know are trapped in condemnation because of things that are in their past, right? God wants to free us from that. How? By recreating us. We say about people all the time, well, that's so-and-so. They're always going to be that way. No, they're not. Like, that is so antithetical to the gospel. The whole premise of the gospel is you can change. Not by trying harder, like Father Matthias was saying at Mass this morning, by surrendering, by giving up, by letting the Lord come into your life. What else has he done? I actually don't like this one. It's kind of annoying. He's rendered sin impotent. By annoying, I mean... Like, the passion takes away all of my excuses for not being better than I am. Sin, capital S, has no power over you or me anymore. Not if we belong to Jesus. This is really hard to come to grips with. Like, I don't have to sin. Neither do you. I do all the time. Because I have memories, and I have habits, and I have instincts that I act on sometimes. But I don't have to sin. Before the passion, like I had no chance, and you had no chance, but you can actually become holy, and I can actually become holy now. We know, Paul says in Romans, that our old self was crucified with him. When? Baptism. So that the sinful body might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin for he who has died is freed from sin, that is, from its power. What else has he done? He's given us authority over the enemy. Behold, I've given you authority, power, his own power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. This isn't to go be stupid and go, you know, Don't rush in where angels fear. But it is to know that the Lord who binds spirits gives us his authority. Why? So that we can then be instruments to liberate others. He sent us on mission to get his world back. I think we understand this passage wrong many times. You know, Jesus says to Peter, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I think oftentimes we hear that and we think, 
Well, no matter how bad it gets, the Lord promised that the church will stay standing. It's not really what he's saying. In fact, some of the churches which existed in the early history of the church aren't standing anymore, most especially the ones in Asia Minor. What the Lord's saying is, like, hell has no chance against me, not me, him. That's what he's saying. Right? Gates are not offensive strategies. Gates are defensive tactics. You're not attacked by a gate. Gates are used to keep people in or to keep people out. The presumption here is that you and I are going to be on the attack against the gates of hell to rescue people who are in need of rescue. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I, I, the one through whom a universe that's 46 million light years across, I, the one who took on sin and Satan and hell and death and crushed them, I, I, the one who holds in my hands the keys of death, I, who have no rival, I, who am Lord now of heaven and earth, I, who hold in my hands all the kings of the earth, I am with you. What are you afraid of? Go. Like, giddy up. Get to work. So we were doing this, uh, we were doing a retreat like this with a bunch of folks out in South Dakota about a year ago. In the middle of one of the breaks, a guy came up to, I think it was to Mary, and said something like, you know, I think I understand all this. This is really helpful. Here's what I don't understand. I don't understand why. Like, why would God do this? And here's the answer. Like, what's the heart of the gospel? What's the core of the gospel, if you could put it that way? I think you could say it's this. You matter. You, not y'all. You matter to the God who speaks and a universe comes into being, who knows the names of all 70 sextillion stars. You matter to him. You're worth the trouble. That's how someone once described what it means to say I love you to somebody else. When a mother wakes up in the middle of the night because her child's crying, it's because the child's worth the trouble. When a husband's sitting at the bedside of his wife and just caring for her as she's going through her final days, it's because she's worth the trouble, right? God made man nailed to a cross out of his love is saying to you and to me, you are worth the trouble of me doing this, right? Remember the icon? Who will go and get him? Who will bring him back? Who will bring him home? I will. Why? Because you're that important to me. And ultimately, because love does such things, and as, like as Romano Guardini said, uh, and God is love. Remember that passage? Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken, and the prey of the tyrant shall be rescued. That was me. That was you. It's still me. <laughs> Many days, right? When I walk back into the enemy's camp. For I will contend with those who contend with you, and then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord, your Savior, and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Some of you know this uh, homily. This is, I think this is like maybe the greatest homily ever given. This is what I call the trash-talking Jesus. This is like LeBron James. 
So Melito of Sardis gives this Easter sermon on Holy Saturday night, which is just out of this world. And the challenge is anytime we read it, it's going to fall short. But you got to picture the Lord risen from the dead, standing on hell's gates, right? Saying this. Who is he who contends with me? This is Jesus talking. Let him stand in opposition to me. I set the condemned man free. I gave the dead man life. I raised up the one who's been entombed. Who is my opponent? Like, you looking at me? You think you can mess with me? I, he says, am the Christ. I am the one who destroyed death and triumphed over the enemy and trampled Hades underfoot and bound the strong man. This is the Alpha and the Omega. This is the beginning and the end, an indescribable beginning and an incomprehensible end. This is the Christ. This is the King. This is Jesus. This is the Lord. This is the one who rose up from the dead. And this is the one who sits at the right hand of the Father. Here's another famous icon that the Eastern Church prays with over and over again. So we often focus on the passion and the crucifixion. The East, our, many of our Eastern brothers and sisters often focus on this image. This is the, um, the Anastasis, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So the Lord's in the center, obviously. He's surrounded by this glow, and he's, his right hand is stretched out to a man. That's Adam. His left hand is stretched out to a woman. That's Eve. Underneath his feet are doors. Huh? Those are the gates of hell. Under his feet, underneath those are locks and chains. Those are all the people that he's liberated. Huh? What's he doing? He's, libera- he's harrowing hell. Remember Ephraim's homily, God went in search of a chariot with which to ride into the underworld. Why? So as to liberate it. What's the chariot? His flesh, which he took from Mary. And he went in there to bring back all those who had held, been held bound. That's you and me. For some of us right now, that's you and me right now. Somewhere in a pit. Maybe I'm discouraged. Maybe I'm feeling hopeless over what's going on in the country. Maybe I'm frustrated. Maybe I'm angry. Maybe I'm holding on to bitterness or resentment or unforgiveness. Remember, I'm struggling with some addiction perhaps. And that Jesus... This Jesus, the one who's going to be present in the Eucharist in a minute, has his hand out right now to you and to me saying, just take it. Or even, let me take your hand. Let me just pull you out of there. I didn't make you to be a slave of anything. I made you to be free. I made you to be alive. So for those of us who who are in a pit somehow, grab his hand. Let him pull you out. Because he wants to do that. We got so many Catholics who all I hear do is complain. I felt like the Lord said to me, He said this to me first, and then he said it to share it with other people. But starting last January, I felt like I just kept hearing this resounding thing from the Lord. Like, John, tell them to stop complaining. Just stop. Do you not know who I am and what I've done? Get to work. So I'm going to invite you, I think Deacon Dave's going to bring in the Blessed Sacrament here in a minute. I'm going to invite you just to, to join me if you're able, right? So just like we're, we're trying to lead people as well, I, I can't ever force somebody to pray something. I'm going to invite you, if you want to, to respond again, right? What we want to do is we want to take a little bit of time. We're, we're done with uh, soaking in the gospel, if you will. We want to transition to, okay, so now what does he want me to do? Because the response piece is twofold. The first part of the response to all that the Father has done for me in Jesus is to give him my life. 
to thank him, to praise him, to surrender to him, right? Remember Jesus on the cross? What's he say from the, from the cross? I thirst. What's he thirsting for? Me and you. My faith, your faith. When the Son of Man comes, Jesus says, will he find faith on earth? What's it mean to have faith? It doesn't mean to assent to the proposition that there's a God. That ain't faith. The faith is, is to say to, to the Lord, Lord, I give up. <laughs> you can have it. Have what? Have everything. You can have my life, you can have my time, you can have my money, you can have my body, you can have everything. Because what could I possibly give back to you for all that you've done for me? Who would I surrender to if not to you? What's the, what's the logical response to a God who is so powerful and not just so powerful but so good that he does all that he's done for us, culminating in that, what's the logical response? How can it be anything other than to entrust ourselves to him and to surrender to him and to give him permission to do whatever he wants? That's the first part of the response. But then there's a second part, and we're going to talk about that when we come out of adoration. So, if you're willing and able to do this with me, I invite you to, to pray this with me yet again, mindful that you and I are living sacrifices and I keep crawling off the altar and God's inviting me to crawl back on right now. So go ahead and join me if you can and want to. Father, I believe that out of your infinite love, you created me. I come before you just as I am with all my brokenness, wounds, and hurts. I am sorry for all the times I have believed the enemy's lies that you are not a good father and don't love me. I repent and ask you to forgive me for all of my sins. Thank you for sending Jesus, the ambush predator, to rescue me from sin, death, hell, and Satan. And so tonight, here and now, I surrender to you, Jesus and desire your lordship over every area of my life. I ask you now to flood my soul with the gift of the Holy Spirit, to know my true identity as your child. Help me to know that in your eyes, I'm worth the trouble, I matter, and I'm worth dying for. Holy Spirit, recreate me to be the person you destined me to be, and to accomplish the plan you have for my life. Please use me as an instrument in your hands to rescue others. Amen. So we're going to bring the, the Lord in. I'm going to invite Deacon Dave's got uh, Jesus. So we're in chairs. If you can sit, great. If you can kneel, that's great too. And I'm just going to put this image back up on the... Uh, screen of the um, Anastasis, of the Lord pulling Adam and Eve out of hell. And I just invite us, however it is the Spirit's moving us to respond to the gospel again today, to feel free to do that. We're going to take 15 minutes, okay? Then we take a break at 2.15. So whatever posture is most comfortable for us to pray in, uh, feel free to do that. And uh, let this be uh, an opportunity to just personally respond uh, as disciples of Jesus and tell the Father how grateful we are and to ask him to take our hand and to pull us out of wherever we might be that we don't want to be.
Jesus, we love you, we thank you, we praise you for all that you have done on our behalf. We give you the remainder of this day. I ask that you continue to mobilize us for mission. We give you permission to use us and to do in, with, and through us whatever you desire so that more and more people might be rescued. 